Well, good morning, everybody. I am glad to be back. I have such a short notice. Um, thank God I preach every week at another church, and I have sermons packed away that I can use that I never used. Or, and um, last time I preached here, I was... Uh, asked or told by my mother-in-law, that beautiful lady over here named Kelly, uh, she said that maybe you should give your testimony uh, so people know where you're coming from, who you are. So today I'm going to give a little bit of my testimony, a little bit, and I'm going to give a sermon. The sermon is called Time to Choose, A Time to Choose. We'll be in, uh, um, let me see, Acts today, chapter 9 verse 3 through 9, and we'll be in Hebrews chapter 4, verses, verse 12. But let us pray before we get started. Father, I just thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for, for giving me my life back so I could give it up to you. Lord, I ask if there's anybody in here that needs to die to self today, that they focus on you and they surrender all of themselves. And they know what it means to die to self and to live as Christ. Lord. There's so many things that we're, I could be grateful and thankful for, Lord, in here. Um, and I ask that you be with Mike and you, you heal him and you be with his kids and you heal them, Lord. You make him come through this quickly. And if anything, produce more character in them, Lord. Let him rejoice while they suffer in a sense. Father, we just thank you so much. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. So for you guys that don't know, I'm a pastor at Restoration Church, uh, which is a ministry of Shoreline Westland Church. Uh, the prayer gathering is going to be taking place in a couple weeks. Uh, it was talked about in announcements this week. And it's for all churches to come to. So I would ask that you guys come there and we can see you guys over there. Um, but... I was born and raised in Sacramento, California, or partially raised a few years of my life, and then I moved over to Alpena. And I'm just going to give you some glimpses into what lifestyle I grew up in. Uh, I was the only white kid in my class. Um, I was getting beat up in the bathrooms, you know, uh, walking to go up and say the Pledge of Allegiance, and I remember one kid grabbing the back of my head and slamming into the flagpole, you know, and it, just those type of things. A lot of gang violence, a lot of I was walking home one day, I was wearing a Raiders jacket, and uh, a van pulled up, and a bunch of people came out and tried to grab me, and they grabbed my backpack and tried to pull me into the van, but I slipped through my jacket and uh, my backpack. Thank God they grabbed my backpack, not me, and I was able to book it home. Uh, so those are the things I faced in California. A lot of crazy, crazy stuff happened, a lot of gangs, a lot of torment, uh, a lot of broken families, and... Uh, so we moved here. My mom decided, my mom and dad decided to move us here. My dad stayed there for a little bit because he had to finish up. He was a general manager at 7 Up. They were both in the Air Force. Uh, that's where they met. And, you know, for a California boy to come over to little Alpena, Michigan, that's just crazy. You don't put a, you know, a line, you know, and, and somewhere that's not a jungle or you know, or not in a cage, you know, and you let them go in this little town where there's just all old people, in a sense. <laughs> At that time, it is growing now. <laughs> I'm getting, I, I'm not that old, but I'm getting there. Trust me, I will be an old person one day. <laughs> and that's okay. That's okay. Um, but my way of life and, you know, Alpina was totally different. It was fast. My way of life is fast, fast paced. You know, we're always on the move and whatnot. And my parents were great. Uh, you know, they had great jobs and they did a lot of good things. But, you know, there was a lot of brokenness in our family, too. And uh, I can remember when I was 10, 11 years old, my dad drinking all the time. You know, I remember, you know, doing things with him on my 13th birthday that I should have never done. You know, me and my friends. And, uh, it was when I was 13, I was at the skate park, and I was already selling stuff at that time. Uh, and I was at the skate park 
skateboarder and I skateboarded. I loved skateboarding. It kept me away from trouble, at least I thought. And there were some kids there and they offered me a pill. I took it. You know, and I'm going to be very PG for the kids in here. Um, but I took it and I loved it. It gave me something that I never had, which was confidence. When I was growing up, I, I could not stand in front of a classroom and give a talk. I could not do my assignments. I would be sick or skip school that day. I got teased when I first moved over here because I had an accent. And um, I was very tan and dark. You know, and they thought I was like, uh, they called me Cha Cha Boy, like from Mexico type. <laughs> you know? And it was really weird. It, it was weird. Um, you can't tell now. I'm very white. My wife's looking at me awkward, and, um, but I'm very white now. And, but I would get beat up all the time in second grade when I moved here, all the time. And one day I, I said I had enough. And so during those periods, I lacked a lot of confidence. So when I took that, it gave me a, a, a warmth, uh, a warmth of love, fake love in a pill. It gave me drive. It gave me uh, something that I, I can I could do all things when I was on that, I thought. I thought. That kept continuing. I was a very big drug dealer in Elkhorn. And I got caught when I was 18 selling handguns from Chicago to Detroit, to Flint, to Saginaw, to Elkhorn. And I thought I had it. I thought I learned it at that time. I thought, you know, enough is enough. You know, Brendan, you're 17, just turned 18, you're graduating high school, and you got to go to jail the first day you graduate. You got to turn yourself in at 5 o'clock to sit in jail time. And you're lucky you didn't go to prison for five years because it's your first time going. And, you know, I thought I had enough. But I tell you, the devil's tricky. He's smart. He knows where to get you. He knows how to conform and twist things so it looks pleasing and good. You know, if you look in Ezekiel, I think it's chapter 48, about the cherub, about the devil. And he is uh, the most beautiful of, of all creation. Just stunning. Magnificent. Um, the beautifulest angel there was. You know, one of the almost, almost the highest in command besides Christ. And he has so many things to offer that will tear your life apart. It kept going on and on and on. In 2007, I was convicted for selling heroin in Alpena County. I watched my friends die next to me. I watched people die. I was doing it myself. I was, you know, it was everywhere I went. 2009, I can remember it like the back of my head, and this is where it all changed. And I got arrested again for delivery of heroin and pills and everything else. And my dad binds me out because it's near Christmas. He wants me home for Christmas. My mom and dad want me home for Christmas. So thank God he just got a social security check. No, oh, not thank God. I should have stayed in there. Um, he got a social security disability uh, payback or whatever because he had some surgeries on his hips and whatnot. And he was able to bond me out because it was a very high bond. Um, I remember I was, I was, I had two thoughts. One, I'm never going to do this again. And two, I need to get high because I am sick. I, my bones, my stomach hurts. I'm puking. I need to get out of here. So when he got out, that thought overtook my heart. It says the flesh, the heart is willing, but the flesh is strong, Paul talks about. He says, I do what I do not want to do. And that's what I was doing. And I go out to a drug dealer's house. And we have gangs in Alpine and Hillman, if you guys don't know it. There's a Spanish cobra. He just got out of prison. I go there. There's a shotgun on the couch. And I'm just, it's a Christmas day. I begged my mom to use her car. Begged her. And I knew there was some things going on with my friend and him. He owed him money or whatnot. And I walk into the house. And he's talking to me. You know, everything's good, I thought. And all of a sudden, he brings up my friend and says, where is he at? Takes that gun, points it at me, click. He loaded it and everything, click, misfire. 
turns it around. He's white as can be, white as a ghost, not cute all over himself. Takes the gun and he starts to beat him. He beats him. So I grab his girlfriend and another baby in my way, and I grab him and I throw him at him to get away, to get somebody between me and him, because I was beaten with the butt of a gun. And he runs down the hallway and grabs me and chokes me. And I'm just looking at him. And I'm, you know, I don't want to fight back because I'm scared to get killed. And I'm looking at him and said, Did you, have you had enough? Can you please stop? And he got up and everything was great. It was so weird. Everything was shaking my hand. Don't retaliate. Please, please don't come at me. Please, here's this. Here's that. Here's some money. Give me everything just so I don't come back to hurt him. Um, it, it was so weird. So I'm walking outside the door, and I walk outside this door, and it seems like the world stops. It seems like the trees, the wind, and birds stop. Everything for a moment. And God says, Brendan, you know me. You know what my will is, and if you don't do that, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know what's next? I lost my life. I was uh, um, brought back probably four times from overdoses. So I've been very close, and this was the last bout. You know, and I feel it greatly because that day, so many things happened to reassure that I wasn't crazy. You know, because maybe I was hearing voices in my head. You know, but so many things happened that day to reassure me that I was not just hearing voices in my head, and that this just did not happen for no reason. And so I go, I get in the car, and there's this girl, and she's a drug addict, and she looks at me, and she goes, have you had enough yet? I'm like, where does that come from? You know, where does that come from? You're a drug addict. Have I had enough yet? You should be asking, where is it at? Come on, let's go. You know, type deal. Not, have I had enough yet? Have you had enough yet? You don't ask another, you know, you don't, you want them with you. You want to bring them down with you. Mercy, or was it Misery Loves Company, Right? Get back home a few hours later, I go walking up the shell, and I'm walking up the shell, and Scott Wheeler, I'm not sure if any of you guys know him, Monica Wheeler, they lost their three-year-old son around this time. And they lost him to, you know, Heather, what it was? Yeah, he just was sick and fell asleep and did not wake up. Super sad. It broke them. Broke them to pieces. So he's searching and begging God, why did this happen? You know, what's going on? And his faith is being strengthened. And so is his wife, because now they're relying on God during this death of her son. So he's listening, and God, for some reason, tells him to go outside. So while I'm walking by, I go around the sidewalk, and he comes walking up right up to me. So God told me to go outside just two minutes ago. For some reason, I had an inkling to come outside. I did not see you before you came. Will you go to church with me? You know, my glasses are all shattered, and I got still a couple blood spots on my face, and you know, and will you go to church with me tomorrow? And I was like, yes, I'll go to church with you. You know, I was in tears. I was like, what in the world? Yes, I'll go to church with you. And then I get to the Shell gas station. So many there's from AA that I know. Hey, you want to go to a meeting tonight? You know, all these things just happen all in one day. So many things happen in one day, tell them, reminding me, please don't go back but come towards me. I'll protect you. Come towards me. And I listened. And I listened. And I, that night, I called all my friends. I wasn't, didn't, didn't do it right, but I called all my friends to stay away from me, please. Stay away. I don't want nothing to do with you. You guys aren't my friends because you guys don't care about me. If you did, you would not give me this stuff. If you really cared about me, you would protect me. That's what a friend does. Not drag you down with, not leave you in jail when they're taking a the charge from you. Hey, that's not what friends do. But they love me, you know. They love me. Just sad, sad. And I go to my girlfriend and I had drugs and everything. And I just threw it at her and I said, I'm done. See ya. Walked away. I still had to go to jail. I still had three to 30 years hanging over my head. Three to 30 years. Most people during this time would have went and used more because they're about to go away for a long time. And they're depressed, scared, don't know what's going on. So, And it's their last time they got a party, you know, whatnot. And, 
Um, but me, I was being obedient. And I started going to meetings, three meetings a day, every day. Went to a treatment center for 14 days, and that's when Christ came into my life for real. I got on my knees, and I just begged, and I was in tears. My dad used to call me names and say bad things to me, and I know my father wouldn't do that to me. And I felt the love from him, and I'm just crying and begging and asking for mercy. Lord, I've hurt people. I've killed people. i watched people die in front of me because of the drugs I've given them. Have mercy on me. Please forgive me. That letter hurt. That letter hurt. Never gave it to my dad. It's still there. My dad has... Me and my dad are good today. We're good. He's a good man. He just did what he knew with what he had. But I bet Christ, that Christ came into my life and I had a new, a new purpose, a new life. No longer to put the fear in people, but to love people. Polar opposites. Love people. To care for people. To lay your life down for somebody. What an amazing change of life. A new creation. I'm going to Shoreline Church, hanging out, whatnot. Uh, Pastor Jim says, you know, I see a lot of people following you and asking you questions and whatnot. Maybe you're a pastor. I'm not sure. I'm not saying you are, but maybe you are called to be a pastor. And okay, and I'm praying at this prayer, and this lady asked me, are you a pastor? Okay, you know, no, I'm not. Um, then I go to uh, Easter Egg Hunt, and they asked me to pray for this Easter Egg Hunt. Who prays for Easter Egg Hunt? You know, who does that? Why would you pray for Easter Egg Hunt? Please, Lord, just don't let them fall and trip, and make sure Lily over here finds all the eggs, Lord. Praise God. You know, who does that? But it says pray in all things. Pray without ceasing. So you do pray. You, you do all things under the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord for all. So I did, and I was, I fumbled it. I fumbled it so bad, I was crying. I felt so embarrassed. Who am I to be doing this? No, this is not me. I am not here to be praying for people, to be talking to people about you. That's not me. So, Lord, I get in the car, and I, we had to fix my vehicle, and uh, my in-laws at the time were living a uh, half block away, about a minute away, literally. I get in the car, and I'm praying, God, God, please, just give me something tangible that I can see, that I can feel, that I can touch. Tell me that I am supposed to be a disciple of you and that I'm here to reach others like you and others all across the nation that need you. And I'm bawling. And I get out of the car, my uh, ex father in law jacks it up and he goes, Brendan, get down here, Brendan, get down here. And I got tears in my eyes. He looks at me, he's like, What are you crying for? You know, and this kind of this weird, you know, why are you crying? I don't know where. Um, he says, look at this. And on the gas tank, there was one of those blue fish and paint about this big. It went from one side of the gas tank to the next. This big, that's a big fish, the blue paint. And I just put a starter on it the week before. So I was underneath the vehicle the week before. I did not see a blue fish the week before. So I prayed and asked God for something tangible, and here he provides it. If it was there, somebody put it there two days before, I don't care. But God provided me a sign. And you know what that sign was? To be fisher of men and women. That's what that meant. Be fisher of men and women. I answered my call. People were coming to my house and meeting with me randomly. I didn't even know them and asked me to pray for them. It was confirmation after confirmation. I become a ministerial student. No, let me back up. I got to go serve time. I get in front of the judge and the, the probation officer, give him three to 30 years. He's going away. He's no good. Prosecutor stands up. No, he is. Even though he's been in here umpteen times, this man is doing something different. 
this man is actually helping people. I've had people call me to tell me to be lenient on this kid that don't even know who they are. He doesn't even know who they are, but they call me to be lenient because he's helping my son or daughter. Whatever. So the judge and the prosecutor go back and talk and come back out. He says, you know, we got one thing we can do because your guidelines say 3 of 30. Your, your points add up. You have to go 3 of 30. So we're going to give that to you. But go to boot camp. Go to boot camp. That's 90 days. Go to jail for a couple months. Go to boot camp. You're good. Get back out. Get back into your life. I did that. Life was free, actually, in prison. I was the freest I could be. I was free because I had Christ. No chains can bound me. No wall can hold my spirit in because I had Jesus. I'm here today, eight, almost nine years later, as a pastor of Restoration Church, and um, I, I preach to those who have habits, who have hurts, who have hang-ups, kind of like celebrate recovery. I preach to all people because we all have hurt habits and hang-ups, don't we? And if you don't admit that, you're lying to me. Unfortunately. But it's the truth. We all have habits, hurts, and hang-ups. So it's for everybody. But I, I get a lot of different uh, walks of life in there. It's just amazing to watch people grow. I went to college, got my associate's degree in Indiana Westland for uh, Science of Christian Ministries. Uh, I completed all my ministerial student classes. I got four more to go to be ordained. I'm licensed. Um, currently almost done with my bachelor's degree in biblical studies. So I've done a lot over the eight years. Um, I taught at Treatment Center, at Sunrise Treatment Center for a few years. My first few years of being in recovery, being sober. Um, I'm a recovery coach for NEMSAS. I, I talk and help coach people and a public speaker for them. And uh, um, God has this abundantly given to me and my family today. He provided me with a great wife and a great family. I went through a divorce. It shattered me. It broke me. It tore me apart because I didn't file for the divorce. The other person did, and it just broke me so bad. Divorces aren't right, people. If you're married in here today, don't get divorced over a fight. Crying out loud. Or because the toilet paper is on backwards. You know, because it's not like a waterfall, it's like an underfall or whatever you guys call it. <laughs> you know? I mean, really, people will fight over this stuff just to fight. Then that fight turns into bigger stuff and that fight gets bigger. Then all of a sudden we're at the courts getting a divorce. Because the judge says, and the city, and the Michigan says, and the United States says, it's okay to get a divorce. It's okay to be married ten times. It's okay. God says, I hate divorce. I hate it. I hate divorce. He uses those exact words. There's a reason, because it disunites people. It, it, it tears the soul. When you become married, you become one in soul, and it tears it right down the middle. And a tear is jagging hard and it hurts. My wife took a chance. You know, I fell for four months. I, I was back out um, doing things and God woke me back up. And I was praying to God every night, begging God, please get me out of this. Don't let me do this again. Then doing it again and I don't know why and I'm freaking out. I don't know what to do anymore. Do I just go to jail and turn myself in and let them arrest me for nothing so I can be behind the bars so I can't do this no more? I really want this. You know, I'm a pa I was a pastor and I had to step down. That's very embarrassing. Very embarrassing when you step down from being a pastor because of divorce and then you relapse and blah, blah. Very embarrassing. She took a chance. And we got married. We got married quickly. We known each other for a lot of years. We did ministry together. We knew who we were. And we know that we don't want to cross the lines where God says, do not do this. Do not do that. And there's a reason for that. So we got married. And our marriage has consisted of Jesus. Jesus, 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 till the day we die. And our marriage is flourishing. It's beautiful. I got great in-laws that are just amazing mothers and dads. And I'm not just boasting so they can feel great and I get brownie points, you know. But I'm telling you, they're great people, people of God, and they planted a seed in my wife, and this seed has grown now. 
And now she's a part of my ministry, and she's a part of God's ministry, and now we are one, and we're working together, and the seeds are being planted, and the harvest is ripe, and they are being rooted up. Did you know today, out of a thousand churches, 61% of them are dying? A thousand? 61% are dying. That's over half. Half of the churches out of a thousand are decreasing majorly in numbers. Majorly in numbers. And the, wrong, the problem is, is because we've got a lot of people that just want to do this. Here's my five dollars. See you next week. There we are. That's the church today. No. The church is more important than that. The church is. When you go into church, Christ says it's, it's a time to choose what you want to do. You want to be a follower or a fan? If you guys ever heard of Kyle Eidelman, a fan or follower, um, or not a fan, is the book. And if you haven't heard of it, check it out. It will enlighten you. It will push you to new limits because it will call you out. It will tell you exactly who you are, who I was. A fan of Jesus. Not a committed follower. Not full hearted follower. So 15 minutes past. You guys all right with that? So, my life, I had a time to choose, a time to change. And today, yesterday, the year before, the year before that, I had a time to choose. God says in Romans 6, or Romans 12, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve that what God's will is. Is good and pleasing and perfect will. It doesn't say change, but it says transform. What's the difference? Changing, I can change my clothes, that's temporary. Transformation is full hearted, complete, utter new creation. That's what transformation is. It's asking you to transform, not just change, not just look the part, not just act the part, but be transformed. Like God transformed me. And he transforms you. And he's transforming others through you. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Here's your sword. And it's sharp. It divides families even. Non-believers and believers. Arguments. It arises. Because God starts stuff. Because he wants the truth to get out. He wants it to get out. He wants to use you. So today I am Pastor Brendan. I am Brendan Roney. They used to call me Brecky. I don't go by that name anymore too much. My parents call me every once in a while. I am a new creation in Christ. And God has given you this time to choose right now. Don't be one of the 61%. You know, I preached on appearance a few months ago. And I preached on, uh, you know, your, your gifts, your purpose a couple weeks ago. Now it's time to make a choice. Got a lot of empty rows just like we do at our church. When's the last time you brought somebody to church? Think about it. When's the last time you just begged somebody, please, I love you, come to church. You can meet God. You can meet him right here, right now. I could give, you know, I could do it right here, but come to church. There's more people there that you need to meet. That's not, this is not the holy, only place, but are we loving people that way? He's got a job for you guys. Look at it. Check it out. Don't fall away from it. Don't miss your mark. 
If you don't fulfill your purpose, you'll feel guilty, you'll feel shameful, you'll feel things will happen if you're not doing what God calls you to do. And if you do what God calls you to do, your life will be beautifully blessed with a lot of pain. That's the key word, pain. You know, pain and paint, paintings are beautiful. God paints a beautiful picture. One of the four words, four letters before that says pain. You make that beautiful picture. You guys are all beautiful and all created by God and all out there to renew your mind daily, be transformed by the renewal of your mind and to do God's will and to tell your neighbors about God. Simple. Simple, but it is absolutely amazing where he will take you. Let us pray. Father, I just thank you so much for bringing us here today. Thank you for letting me tell a little bit of my story. It's not about me. It's not about nothing I did, but it's all about you, Lord, all about what you did. Father, I just praise you so much. Lord, I ask that for those, if anybody in here wants to surrender to the life of Jesus, that they do it now. There's not a prayer that needs to be said. It needs to be a heart issue, a true action by them, Lord, and push them, Father, to take that action. Father, I ask that you grow this church, not just in numbers, but spiritually in heart. Got great people here, Father, a great pastor, and just use them. Spread your word, baptizing people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We thank you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.